Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, um, I think we can start. So welcome everyone to the Symposium on Brains, Minds, and Machines. Um, let me first say a few words um, before we start with the first session. So this symposium is organized uh, by Tommaso Pocho, Gabriel Kreiman, and me. I'm Max Nickel. Um, we are all part of CVMM, the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, which is an NSF science and technology center funded for um, 10 years and it's a multi-institutional MIT, Harvard, um, and so on. And in fact, uh, Tomaso is the director of CVMM. So the idea of the symposium uh, today is to discuss current results in the scientific understanding of intelligence and how we could use these results to possibly create um, more intelligent machines. So in a way, what we're interested in is how today's science enables us uh, to create new methods to engineer intelligence. And this understanding of intelligence um, requires theories at different levels spanning neuroscience, cognitive science, uh, machine learning, AI. Um, and we are very excited to have what I think is really a fantastic list of speakers today. So in alphabetical order, uh, we will have talks from Surya Ganguly from Stanford, Demis Hassabis, Google DeepMind, Christoph Koch from the Allen Institute for Brain Science, uh, Gabriel Kreiman from Harvard, Tomaso Pocho from MIT, Andrew Sachs from Harvard, and Josh Tenenbaum, um, also from MIT. Um, so in a few words about the format, we will first have um, a series of invited talks. If there's time, um, we have um, possibilities to ask questions. And at the end, we will also have a panel discussion um, of the symposium, and there, uh, Gary Marcus and Terry Sinowski will also join the discussion. So um, without further ado, let me hand over to Tomaso. Yeah, thanks, Max. Um, welcome to everybody. And um, um, the theme of the workshop is really in the title. And the subtitle here is uh, Today's Science is Tomorrow's Engineering. Um, I want to explain why this workshop, and, uh, and this is also an explanation of why this uh, Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, which is organizing this symposium. Um, this is more or less the plan of what I want to tell you. The main messages is, are that recent advances in AI, especially deep learning, have come to basic science of decades ago. Um, and that um, we should, as a community, or at least part of this NIPS community, should uh, realize that there is a need for basic research on human intelligence. I stress human intelligence. And of course, if you are a scientist, you don't need uh, an engineering justification for doing scientific research on the brain and the mind. Um, but there is also an engineering justification, and I will briefly mention a few recent results that uh, point in this direction. <clears throat> so let me start with things everybody of us knows that uh, we have seen in the last 10 years quite a number of uh, su surprising and great successes of AI from uh, Deep Blue to Watson to drones that can land on aircraft carrier like the X-47B. Um, in general, the appearance of machines that mimic human performance and are even better than us in narrow domains of intelligence. And uh, um, of course, deep learning um, was the story of the last two years um, from DeepMind, which is one of our industrial partners in the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Um, to this review on deep learning of Jan LeCun and uh, Joshua Benjo and Jeffrey Hinton. Now, even more than scientific paper, I think that the real success 
of AI are things like <laughs> understanding to the next level where the degree of details required to support self-driving cars So this is Mobileye, is an Israeli company started by Amnon Shashua, who's a student and postdoc of mine, and it's giving vision to the car using machine learning. So that's a very difficult task, of course, um, and uh, um, very successful at it. Um, this, of course, was based on uh, um, machine learning um, old work 20 years ago in uh, at CMU, for instance, uh, Dean Pomerlo in my lab, um, from which this real sequence came. This was a system trained with images of pedestrians working in a Mercedes in Ulm to detect pedestrians. And uh, of course, at the time, we were very happy about performance. It was only one error every three, sec every three frames. That means 10 errors per second. So completely unusable, whereas Mobileye today has a, about one error every 30,000 kilometers of driving. So that's 20 years. Now, my main point is all these kind of advances started from suggestions coming from actually neuroscientists. As you probably know, it was from the work of Hubel and Wiesel in V1 primary visual cortex, which is on the back of our head, is the beginning of visual information processing in the ventral stream, is th that that uh, gave uh, the ideas of hierarchical models of neurons doing dot products, convolution-like, and then pooling for invariance in a hierarchical way. And um, the first quantitative models of s s such uh, kind was uh, much later, was by Fukushima in the 80s. A modern version was HMAX in my group, which is shown here, which is really a more sophisticated, a more biological version of Fukushima model. And uh, the architecture is exactly the same as the deep learning network. So today, with uh, dot products, convolution like, and uh, pooling to give invariance and iterating this. And the system works pretty well. Um, uh, but of course, we need to make similar advances in order to enable the next generation of intelligence machines between, beyond feed-forward deep learning networks. And this is the justification for this symposium, justification for our um, STC center. Um, and so our center focuses on the problem of intelligence, which I think is one of the great problems in science. Um, together with the origin and the nature of the universe, the origin of life, and so on. Probably the greatest of all. Um, and so our mission is to make progress in understanding intelligence. That This means understanding how the brain makes the mind, how does the brain work, how to build intelligent machines. And so our goal, and I hope the goal of many of you here, is about science of intelligence first, and engineering of intelligence second. Um, now, uh, I think it's the convergence of significant developments in various areas of science, from computer science and especially machine learning, and um, neuroscience, and cognitive science. I think this is what will allow us to make progress on this great progress in problem in science. And, uh, we try to represent all these disciplines in the talks of this uh, symposium today. Now, I want to make a brief point about the fact that I think the problem of intelligence in general, in the abstract, is ill-defined from a scientific point of view. And with scientific, I mean natural science. This is a point that Francis Crick used to, this is Francis Crick with David Marr and me, many years ago, used to make that um, science is only natural science, is the study that thinks that exist in nature. And so 
Um, if we want to study intelligence, we really have to study human intelligence. And this is really why the, the Turing test makes a lot of sense. Now, um, human intelligence is not one problem. This would be like saying that biology is one problem. It's just one Nobel Prize. That's it. Human intelligence is many problems, and some of them actually correspond to different parts of the brain. Um, think, for instance, at the number of questions that any one of us can ask about an image, just a simple image like the one shown there. You can ask about who is there, what is there. You can ask many more complex questions about what a person is thinking about the thoughts of another person, and so on. We don't know how to build the machines that can answer all these questions. We cannot possibly have supervised learning pre-trained for all the infinite number of questions you can ask. So we want to understand how the brain does that. We want to have models that explain uh, the computational behavioral level, how people do answer this infinite number of questions, and what happens in the brain, in the circuits of the brain, when people answer. There is one example of such a question. Um, it's uh, face recognition. Uh, we don't need uh, really engineering to motivate this question, how does our brain recognize faces? And this is the question where we probably are closer to answers at all the levels, the level of uh, um, knowing which parts of the brain are involved when a human person recognizes faces. These are uh, face patches in the human cortex um, that are active when you recognize a face. Then we can localize similar homologue uh, patches in the brain of the macaque. Um, this is work by Doris Tsao and Virik Freiwald. Virik is um, part of our center. And then you can study uh, with electrodes and fMRI the interaction between this network of face patches and record from these neurons and come up with models. We have done that recently with Virik that can emulate the performance of humans in recognizing faces and predict some non-trivial properties of the neurons involved, like mirror symmetry in patch AL. Um, so that's an example of the kind of problem we want, the question we want to answer, and the different levels to which we want to get these answers. This, of course, is a much higher bar than what Facebook or Google have, who do not care about with what is really the circuits in, of neurons that are implementing the various algorithms. Now, there is more than, than this kind of purely scientific question. Coming from the ventral stream, um, work that we've been doing in trying to um, understand what's going on and the kind of computation that are carrying out in V1, V2, V4, uh, the fact that they seem to be geared towards producing representations that, that are invariant to transformations. We have come up with results, uh, of which I give you only one example, um, which may tell us why hierarchies are better than shallow networks. So the, uh, I mentioned this briefly. Um, if we have a function of, n of d variables, then both a shallow network, one hidden, one hidden layer, like this formula shown on the left, extreme top left, with the sum of ci. This is a network with linear rectifiers. Um, we know that such a network um, can approximate a function of d variables, which is continuous on a finite domain, bounded domain, as well as you want. Um, we also know that the hierarchical network on the right can do the same thing, but the new result is that if you want to approximate functions on D variable uh, that have this compositional structure shown on the top right of being the combination of computations done by two variables at a time, um, then it turns out that the deep network has a much lower VC dimension 
can have a much lower VC dimension than the shallow network, giving a big advantage in sample complexity. And uh, part of the other results show that there are several visual computations for which compositional functions are important. Um, so I think there is going to uh, a theory of your why hierarchies and what are the parameters there, how many layers and so on is uh, developing. And this will have been important not only from the scientific point of view in understanding the ventral stream, but also for uh, um, the development in the engineering. So let me skip this point, which I think is important. I don't think deep uh, convolutional networks or other computer vision systems are really doing object recognition the way humans do, and this is mainly because of the very peculiar eccentricity dependence of everything in the ventral cortex. Um, this will take some more time, so I'll skip this. Let me just finish here summarizing what I tried to tell you. There are mainly um, two or three messages. One is that the engineering success of today usually comes from idea motivated by the scientific advances of yesterday. We believe this will continue in the future. So that's one of the reasons, but not the most important one for looking, for doing, for working to the uh, science of human intelligence. And I gave you a couple of examples, one more on the scientific side, one potentially more on the engineering side of those kind of scientific work. And let me finish with just saying that <clears throat> I think the next stage, we are in the stage of computer science and machine learning, uh, which is labelers. You know, we used to have programmers. Now we need teams in uh, India or Sri Lanka like Mobileye has for labeling images in order to train with millions of labeled example um, modern um, uh, deep learning system. Okay, let me, sorry. Okay, and uh, but I think uh, this is still big data. Is uh, the number of labeled as example going to infinity in the sense that the more labeled example you have, the better? Um, 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 but I think the goal, the ideal is to have system that can learn like children do, mostly by themselves, not only, but mostly by themselves. And then the real challenge is to work with small data. So the metaphor, which is actually due to Stu Jimen, is, uh, is, uh, is n going to 1. Let me finish here. Thank you. Could you please um, just clarify the focus on human intelligence as opposed to like any organism solving a problem, be it a human or a macaque or a Drosophila fly or something? So I'm not saying it's wrong to focus on humans, but can you clarify the, the logic behind that emphasis? Yeah, so. Um, I think, uh, um, first of all, you know, just in terms of a strict definition, um, if you take for science, natural science, it can study only things that exist in nature. Okay, so how many things are intelligent in nature? I don't know. I would choose as at least one of the best example, the human brain. That's, you know, the strict de definition of this. 
But the other part is, um, I think it, despite attempts to do that, uh, you can try to define some general intelligence in the abstract. I think the problem is ill-posed, is ill-conditioned, it has too many possible solutions. There are many ways to be intelligent. And uh, that's why you know, the Turing test is so attractive to many people, because that's basically a definition of human intelligence that we can study, to which we can refer to. Oh, um, we have, I think, time for one more question. Um, well, so I want to tell me, um, at the end, you mentioned um, the number of examples going into one, supervised learning, um, the role of unsupervised learning in that um, uh, regard. Can you comment on that? Um, so the question is how to do it. And uh, I always thought that the fact that you need millions of labeled examples to train a deep um, neural network was, from the biological point of view, a real problem for the biological plausibility of deep learning. I now think that there may be a way around it. And um, the way around it could be something like, let's call it implicit labeling or implicit supervision. You could imagine that uh, you have simple mechanisms in uh, the brain of organisms based on a small number of simple heuristics that allows you to label um, in an implicit way different, for instance, images. If I look now at, at Pierre, Pierre Baldi here, and I get over a few seconds several frames, several images of your face. I don't need to, your to know your name in order to label those images for training a network. I can just know, if I know that you are the same X face has not changed, then all these images are labeled with X, right? So these simple heuristics of, say, time continuity, there is no big discontinuities in the optical flow in what I, I see can be a heuristic to allow implicit labeling. It's not the only one, just an example. And so, in, you know, in two years, a baby may get back of the envelope optimistic calculations about 10 million images. Suppose that there is, he manages to do implicit labeling of 10% of them, it's already 1 million. That may be enough to get a neural network up to speed. So that's just one. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Mm -hmm.